happened in the 90s. Yabba-dabba fruit, delicious stew. Oh, 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 I'm uh, hungry. Santa, my pebbles! Your pebbles? Tis the season to be sharing, Fred. Happy holidays, pal. Oh, Fred. Fruity and Cocoa Pebbles cereals, part of this nutritious oh, breakfast. Oh, oh. She's trying to strike up a conversation with me, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> Dude, I was at Big Lot, man, and, like, uh, some lady with a cart full of shit just starts this conversation about how I could save on furniture by checking out Craigslist. Oh, they're giving stuff out for free a lot of times. (laughs) Yeah. You just go to Craigslist and like, okay, thank you lady. Um, I'm just the guy in front of you on the line, but like she would not, she would not end this fucking conversation until I was called up next, uh, man. And, and and I noticed she had a cereal box of Peeps. This is how I really know you're a weirdo, uh, because Peeps should not be ingested in any fucking format, let alone the cereal version. They have and a cereal. Had, of course, they have a Peep cereal at Big Lot. They fucking do. You damn right they do, <laughs> man. And I, I Big Lot is not my go-to for groceries, but I'm pretty sure they had a better lineup than some goddamn peeps you could have got some generic frosted flakes i would add some fucking uh star crunch or whatever the fuck they call it <laughs> yeah cereals. dude Ugh, uh, be- cereal that that's a dangerous human being that you were talking to steve she's delirious yeah. in some way but i hate that dude huh. when you're in a public place and this is how it happens to me i'm a nice guy so like if somebody makes eye contact with me i'm like oh hey how you doing man you know, something like that. Something general. The universal head nod. Exactly. Just, just yeah. that. I might even go, hey, how you doing today? And all I want back is good. How are you? And then uh, that's it. We're good. The conversation is finito. But when you do that, you do open yourself up to a little bit of, uh, you know, somebody just telling you about their daughter or some shit. They're like, where are you from? This, that. It's like <sighs> 10 minutes later, we're still talking. <laughs> I got these Mucinex coupons. And, you know, you can buy two of them and you can get four if you go to CVS. Well, shut up, bitch. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, you had to, especially in big lots. I mean, usually it's like a, a line in a bank or something. And then you can just walk away. But a big lots, there's just a lot of insane people walking around the, that <laughs> establishment. So. Yeah. And, and I feel like that doesn't reflect on big lots character. Uh, big lots, no, th- this isn't Walmart. You know, they deserve that. Uh, but big lot, you, you've been pretty stand up, but you've been around uh, at least most of my, all of my life. Uh, you were here before me and I've never heard bad things about you. Big lots. You don't deserve to be selling peeps. That's what Walmart does. I mean, Especially peep peep cereal. cereal. That's just like, that's a, a bastardization of even just pee. I don't like peeps, which means yeah, at all. intrinsically, I don't like anything that says peeps on it. I've seen other things. But not a cereal, not a fucking cereal. That's dude. That's like some sort of um, the government's trying to cull the population. They're just trying to kill people off. So they're like, may, anyone eating this cereal is going like they're not. They're worthless. So that's what you feed people in correctional facilities. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, that's Jesus. wild. But hey, I love me some big lots. I think I even mentioned it. This is very bizarre, but I mentioned it. I. I bought mattresses there. If you needed like a shitty, cheap, but new, unjizz covered piece of furniture, yeah. feel free. But I do think that there's an air of um, it's not a classy place. Let's put it like that. You know, it's there's a there's yeah. the good Italian restaurant and then there's Olive Garden. And in terms of a store, there's a there's a, even a Target and then there's the big lots and in that there's like a lot of questionable personalities that shop at big lots. Like when we would go in LA and invariably you'd see somebody talking to themselves, somebody just with a cart full of cat food, those kind of people where it's like, these people are coming out of their like hovels. They're like mole people. Like I just need, I need the thing. 
in this case, it was yeah. material and to tell you to buy Craigslist furniture, but you're not going to see those same people in a big lots. You know what I'm saying? Or in a, in a target. No, no, not Target. No. And I, I, I think big lot might be a, t- just a tier away from dollar general you're not too far removed they're they're close they're about first cousins yeah because you get i mean dollar general 99 cent store that's you know that's even below a big lots but not it's only because they don't they don't sell furniture steve because i think that's the only differential that we're talking that's really it so i don't know i i feel your pain uh, I don't necessarily go to Big Lots a lot, but I'm not going to besmirch the company. So salute to Big Lots. Merry Christmas to Big Lots. But I also, I don't like the fake Christmas cheer. I'm nice all year round. I don't need a holiday exactly. to make me act better. And I don't like, exactly. like you said, being around people where it's like, gives you an extra excuse to talk to me. Because I like to be by myself and with my wife. I don't need to talk to somebody about, you know, the the what happens when you juice a lot. You know, <laughs> Jesus, man, like, w- like speaking of Christmas, what is like the criteria of a Christmas movie? Like, is there like, obviously Christmas has to be a part of the plot. The uh, family is celebrating Christmas or it's in the background somewhere. Clearly it's December, late in December in the, in the storyline. Mm-hmm. Like does the release date play into it? Um, I mean, I, there are movies that are Christmas releases, but I don't think necessarily there it's usually like a, a blockbuster, like a star Wars or something like that would come out on Christmas. My cri- see the criteria has changed when we were yeah. kids, a Christmas movie was a movie about Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. And then die okay. hard came out. Come out to the coast. We'll get together, have a few laughs. And people started associating that as a Christmas movie, which widened the range of what a Christmas movie is. Now it's, is it in Christmas? Because now you can like shoot somebody, but if it's in the Christmas season in the movie, it's a Christmas movie. So I don't know. But now this, this piggybacks me to a question I have for you, Steve, from your okay. childhood or even now, what is your like top Christmas movie. Oh man, easily Home Alone. That's a no-brainer. Look at those grand arrays. Okay. Well, I agree. You know, ninety-nine percent, I agree with you. But there's a movie that I have to stand up for because, for some reason, everyone shits on this movie. I don't get why, uh, but the movie A Christmas Story, where Ralphie gets the BB gun. I don't know. It's it's probably personal because me and my family watched it all the time but that's yeah, my didn't. top christmas movie and it's a good christmas movie regardless oh, yeah. of what my wife says it's a good christmas movie and i've heard a lot of people besmirching it even on the radio today in harrisonburg virginia um people just shit on this movie and i just don't get it so that's my number one but home alone i get it it's right there it's the Colkster. It's the Colkster, baby. The Colkster, one of the, I mean, you have a, a lot of arguments to say he might be the goat of this child acting gangster shit. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. there's a couple that you could have. I'm a saying Elijah for. Wood because Elijah Wood continued into adulthood too. So I'm going with that. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, you, I feel like Home Alone is even now, like people just love that movie. I per, even, I, this is going to maybe a spicy take too, but I love me some home alone too, almost as much, oh, if yeah. not more than home alone. Both classics, as long as Pesci and Stern are there. I mean that they make that up too. They like, they make that work. Cause this is Pesci in his prime. Like, you know, P- Pesci was fucking killing it. Good fellas. Uh, was it the super? No, it was was he in the super? I think he was Vin- eight heads in a duffel yeah. bag. Uh, My cousin Vinny. Yes. And and he was just like, you know what? I'm just going to kiss the game goodbye. Like Jordan. He was like, man, I'm going to get this three Pete and be like, peace. And you, you really ain't seen him since. And then he popped up in casino. 
Uh, but like this is Pesci in his prime, man. And uh, I feel Home like Alone it's Daniel too. Stern in his prime too. I, this month, oh, yeah. everybody, that trio, that team, because that's really what the movie's about. I mean, fuck his family and all yep. that, but um, it does have John Candy in it too. Or rest in peace. But uh, those three people make the movie, and I mean, in both cases, they just. I just have so many fond memories of it. So I do hold those in high esteem. And there's a lot of other good Christmas movies. Um, Jingle All the Way, I'll even say, is a good one as well. I love that. But Christmas Story, just stop shitting on it. Okay, guys, everybody out here doesn't like it. Check it out again, because I think it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. there's a reason why they play it all day every Christmas, man. I mean, it, it gives you the spirit. It gives you that warmth that just makes our dicks hard in December. It's and it's about it's just a, so simple of a story. It's just a movie about a kid who wants a toy and what he's willing to do to get it. And there's the trials and tribulations of being a kid. So mm-hmm. I I think it's a personal thing, but. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's my top. That's my Christmas go-to, even though I haven't seen it in fucking a decade. But And it, it's set in uh, Cleveland. Yeah, hell yeah. I think you can still go to the house. Yeah, fuck yeah, man. Steve, so, let's go to the house. Let's go Let's go rub that leg lamp. I hope they have the leg lamp in the window. It has to happen. It, oh, it's a must, man. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this is because Scream 2 was released in December, December 12th, 97. Um, Mm -hmm. and Christmas movie is probably the last thing you think of when you say, when you think of Scream 2. Yeah. But But, also, no, actually, no, because dude, I I had a great date on Christmas day one time when we were in college, I went to see a movie called Black Christmas on Christmas. (laughs) It's just a Mm -hmm. stupid horror movie, but, um, yeah, there's something about like, uh, they would do that, especially in the nineties or like in that time period, it was like from the late nineties to early two thousands, they started releasing a lot of horror movies on Christmas. Like maybe just to like, I don't, I don't even know why it was just switch it up. Exactly. But yeah. Scream two. I don't remember seeing it. I don't think it's a Christmas movie other than the fact it came out around that time. But dude, I used yeah. to love me some scream also. That was a good fucking series mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah, dude, because it, it came out on the same day as Home Alone 3, the, the first one without the Colkster. So it's just like that's when I checked out, Steve. I saw I've oh, seen yeah. Home Alone 3, and all I all I know is that I hate that movie. Okay. I just hate it. It did it did have a young Scarlet Joe though. Really? I don't remember that. <laughs> And, and, you know, we're, we're 30 something year old men, but understand people, Scarlett Johansson is a year older than us. So when she was young, Scarlett Joe, we were we were young Steve and Matt. So yeah. I didn't realize that movie came out like it. I thought that came out when we were almost like in our 20s. You know, no, we were freshmen. Yeah, that's I remember we were freshmen in high school and I, I knew uh, at that time being 14, I was like, no, the Colster. No, not there. Yeah, I'm checking out of that. I mean, I don't think anybody from the Ridge was in that. They just they were just like, let's make some money real quick. Let's cash in this one again. Which is what they no I think they did on this new shit that they just released too. Is the same. I think it's the same thing now. They just like remake it every five years or so so they can cash in on the name. John Hughes sign off on this shit? No. Is, yeah, is there a no. John Hurds? No. Is, is there a Catherine O'Hara? No. No Pesci's? No Stoins? No, no Colkster? No. Somebody go bash that movie over the head with a shovel and then shove it into a big ass garbage can full of uh, salt. What was it in there? <laughs> was it salt? I don't know. You know what I'm talking on about, the old man, the fucking guy from the first one. Oh, the. Uh... The scary guy. He hit, him with a, he hit him with a fucking snow shovel. Yeah, but what? That, like they, the rumor was that he killed people and put them in that big ass garbage can he had that he was always lugging around that had like salt on it for the ice. So, man, no, I was a deep I don't know, fuck, guys. Sorry, I'm high. Is, I, I'm, I'm accessing parts of my brain that shouldn't be clicking right now. It's it's a good time. Maybe this is what they do in psychiatrist's office. Um, <laughs> oh God! No. I'm pretending I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not crazy. I'm just a little unwell. 
Yeah. Dude, this is episode 51. Can you believe it? 51. 51. We almost are a year into this fucking monster. Yeah, man. We've been hitting them in the mouth, Matt. Hitting them in the mouth for about 52 weeks straight. Mm. Dude, we're like, we almost God, there. we're like fucking Guile and Street Fighter, Steve. Fucking flexing Je- right now. <laughs> Jean-Claude Guile, he will be called. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm here, Mr. B- I can't even do it. I always end up doing an Arnold when I try to do a fucking Jean Claude, dude. Yeah, you got to differentiate your badasses, your 90s badasses. Uh, you Jean Jean-Claude, <laughs> Claude Van Gyle. And you know, fucking uh, Mr. Miguel Nunez, Joanna Man, he, he's somewhat of a 90s legend, too. Oh, uh, yeah. In his dude. Own right. Yeah. Pretty Ricky, what they call him, what though. They call it's, him. <laughs> And, and his accent is is no better than your Jean Claude accent Dude. when he's playing JD with, with, with the fucking braid. I'm from the islands, Bison. It's in the cowards. But but, but uh, pretty Ricky Nunez, uh, JD or K, was it JD or Katie? Who I didn't like his character in the, in the video game. Anyways. Oh DJ or DJ DJ. Fuck it, DJ BJ. Dude, oh, I love man. DJ in the video game, but in this, he was just like he was just like a secretary for M. Bison. And, and Sagat is a bitch in this movie, and I never liked him in the video game either. I used to call him Saget, but mm-hmm. rhymes with everybody. Did. I feel like yeah, that's universal. Yeah. They should have just named. They probably named him. <laughs> So, so it wasn't just me, okay? Just hey, and this was the '90s, and we were kids, okay? So cancel that. You were in Ohio. I never heard the word before I got to Ohio, and then I was just saying it like the. So yeah, Middle America, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, I I loved every. I just this movie. Them. Well, we'll get into it, but yeah, I did like Sagat in the movie. I just didn't like him as a video game character, but Sagat in the movie was just like a little scumbag badass, though. It's like a little sexy <laughs> tile dude, just fucking with the with the eye patch, hey. Steve. Um, I mean, the dude had a weak crew. Kid and yeah. Ryu, it was it was six or four against two. They got the ass whipped, so then they had to pull out the real guns. They they was hitting them with the bullshit tennis guns. They're like, okay, that's funny. The two of us could still beat y'all's ass, and they did. And yeah. they were like, all right, so now we're just that's what bitches do. You that's what like the most punk motherfuckers pull out that goddamn it when they got it on them. If they knew that, if they know they can't fight. That's what the most punk, that, and that's what that's what Sagat the, that's what his crew did. I mean, he had, he had the sexy flexy crew, Steve. He had Vega the the model who like I don't want Vega on my team. Vega, I hate Vega too. I always thought he was a bitch. He and, and we'll talk about that too, man. Look what's popping up at Burger King. Toy Story Puppets from Disney's latest adventure movie now in theaters. Get all four high-quality puppets for your kids. $1.99 each with any great-tasting value meal. But, uh, yeah, boys and girls, this is Steve G (laughs) and Matt G with Happen in the 90s, a show where we talk about things that happen in the 90s. So get out your Festivus polls and your Cephas and Reese's CDs because it's a silent night. What kind of night is it, Steve? (laughs) night. All was calm. All was bright. Bright like that cop. That cop that shine that light in my damn face. You know I ain't do it, man. You know I ain't do nothing, man. You started beating me with that Billy Club man like Rodney. Man, he know I didn't do it. They know I do it. Why ain't y'all singing a fucking song? It's happening in the 90s, <laughs> motherfucker. Oh, it's a wild one, Steve. We're running out. Christmas doesn't come for people who like television shows in the 90s because there is the cupboards are bare. The cupboards are bare, everybody. We're running out. (laughs) The content, it's about to just be me and Steve just reminiscing because there's nothing out there. We had to just fucking scramble here. 
Well, Matt, I'm realizing doing this show, you know, how the television world works. I mean, this was in the 90s, but I, it's probably still ran this way when, you know, the, the sitcoms take a break. It's the holidays. Hey, spend time with your family and we'll revisit in like mid-January. So we probably won't get to the good. Ep- well, in Living Color was a good episode, which we'll cover. But like, you know, the Martins and, you know, the the Cheers and Roseanne's and shit, they probably didn't reconvene until January. Uh, and this was TV wide, CBS, NBC. I feel like they kind of follow the same schedule in a way, in a way. You got to have a break. Those celebrities need time off, Steve. So they're people, too. Exactly. They needed a month for Christmas and consequently other than movie releases which are rampant in december i mean this is when they're uh, even now even to this day they do release blockbusters in this time so we're gonna get some good movies but tv wise god damn like maybe there were some good montels on or some shit like some daytime tv that we're not acknowledging maybe we should widen that out can we get are there widely available montel uh williams and all that shit i almost said montel jordan's yeah, uh, I mean, we can get both uh, Montel Jordans and Montel Williams, man. Uh, maybe they should collab. <laughs> that, that fabled Montel Jordan show that nobody saw. But no, I mean, I enjoyed both. I'm going to say right now, right off the bat, Steve, both things that we saw, just especially Street Fighter, the movie, boy, it set off a lot of nostalgia for me because while it is one of the shittiest movies of the 90s, I must have watched this movie hundreds of times as a kid. So I did not watch it as a kid. I, I was a fan of the video game, like everybody, our generation. But um, I, I remember hearing how bad it was. And I was more into Mortal Kombat as a kid. Um, and I did watch that in the theater. But yep. uh, the, the takeaway from this movie that I do also remember uh, Raul Julia, uh, his final performance, man. Um, and it, this was the the one shining light in a bullshit movie. Um, R.I.P. to that man. And, Gomez uh, Adams himself. And he is he is the one person actually acting in this movie. So he killed it. Yeah. And what a great villain. You know what yeah, I mean? I don't know how sure, if he man. played a villain. I'm not really familiar with his career other than Adams family and a a few other things I may have seen him in, but this guy would have made a great villain in anything. I wish we could have seen more of that, but yeah, it's bizarre that this was his last movie. It's kind of unfortunate. It is man. And, uh, and Bison is a badass character. Uh, Even he would piss me off because he was the final boss uh, on street fighter too. But uh, if there was anybody to play him, man, I feel like uh, Raul Julia did it justice. Yeah, he had some uh, Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars vibes in that movie. I, I, like the everything about it. We're, we're going to get into it. We keep talking about it. But yeah, this is all just to say, you know, if Street Fighter the movie is one of the best things we could have seen this week, that just goes to show that, you know, this we're doing our best, everybody. So just stick with us. Enjoy these shitty shows and or movies that we may have to cover. But I cannot wait for maybe... Uh, some late January lists where we have a little bit more to pick from. You know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, so it's December 23rd. So we're going to be talking about all things 12, 2, 3, uh, three. three in the 90s. I'm excited, Steve. So yeah. what, what do we got? Yeah. What's happening? Well, on 12, 23, 1990, in Living Color is airing episode 25. They they hit the quarter century mark with this episode. Okay. Uh, and we're starting off with Afrophone. Uh, Takia Crystal Kima mm-hmm. is selling Afrophones. And these things are crazy looking, Steve. I mean, uh, she's on the In Living Color switchboard. And for just the only $39.99, you can get that insane looking uh, head behind Steve. That doubles as a phone. Yeah. Um, and not only do you get that crazy mannequin headphone thing, uh, you do also get a, uh, a blooper tape of all the wacky behind the scenes moments from In Living Color, which basically seems to just be Jim Carrey falling a lot. Yeah. And once again, 
exemplifying why he's the goat of this <laughs> physical comedy shit, man. Uh, just he's he plays a waiter and he's just clumsily, lapsadaisically just dropping shit. He's dropping shit at the restaurant, dropping shit on the in living color set. Just wah, wah, and he's just being just so animated with it. Just wah. um, uh, I and I know at one point you're going to come up with a retort for for my on my claim that he is the goat. I I, I see it. I see it. You're 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 gonna you're gonna whip out Chris Farley somehow, and I love Chris Farley. Just as much as you do, but come on, man! Like you, you're, gonna, mean, you, you're talking about like longevity. Of course, Jim Carrey is going to be the goat. But if we're talking just pure comedy moments, I mean, you want to try to take Chris Farley off the top of the mound? I mean, that's a big fucking load to move. So good luck. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to take him off the mountain, man. But there's only one. That's true. There's only one. This is Highlander, it, 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 so you might be right. I, I can't think. I mean, other than those two, I mean, there's other ones, obviously, but uh, just you're. I'm gonna bow down, Steve. I'm not gonna argue. I'm not gonna. This is the Christmas time. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna give in. I'm gonna be a good person. I, I, I'm doing a preemptive argument because I just know it's going to happen. <laughs> like, let's do a Mount. It's a Mount Rushmore, and the, and those two are on there for sure. Um, I don't want to be the the late great Farley. Uh, I mean, Tommy Boy, Sandusky, Ohio, represent, man. Even in Tommy but, Boy, when he does that in the beginning, when he's hanging out with all his college buddies before he goes home, and he's like, we're going to we're gonna do a thing or two. We're going to make something out of ourselves. We're going to show. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and it. Like we cut to the next scene, and it's uh, Vera de Milo, Veracosa, the mistress of destruction. And once again, it's bah, 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 bah. Uh, he's belly bulging, he's pelvis bulging, slashing heads, and he's captured, conked on the head by Keenan Ivory Wayans, who plays Keeman of the Hanna Barbarians. <laughs> and he speaks the native tongue of dyslexia. Yeah, first there was Lou Ferrigno, then there was Arnold Schwarzenegger, now Vera. <laughs> This is I forgot about this character, but yeah. this kind of trans character that he played. <laughs> what is he? What did he say? First... It's watch her bill. The I think the quote was watch her Billy Ball. Just she lets loose the wind of the gods. <laughs> like, yeah, it, watching this stuff now, even even as a kid, there was a, a bit of cringe because I mean, this is a grown ass man and he's putting his his hairy pits in people's faces and he's wearing the speedo and he's acting like a girl showing his nips and shit but hey jim gary he'll do whatever for the laughs what's the girl to do yeah he spits in keeman's face <laughs> and keeman yeah keeman takes off varicose's bra which pisses varicose yeah. off and he gives keeman the poison pit yeah then he does a nasty boy special which i mean i don't know who got it from who but i I feel like everybody, while this was being filmed, Jim, Keenan, Ivory Waynes, the people filming it, everyone was disgusted with what they saw. Because like you said, I mean, this is hilarious, but we have to stare at Jim Carrey's disgusting, pasty-ass body. And it also, yeah. does he have like a dip in his mouth? Um, Because he has like gross I, shit coming. He's spitting. He has like a yeah. lip kind of thing going on. There's a lot yeah. of that, Steve. There's a lot Super of gross. just feminine energy going on. I didn't care. For, I didn't care for how disgusted I felt, but I was laughing my ass off. And I, this was a very uh, this was like a reoccurring character. So yeah, this is one of his first recurring characters, Good man. And next. Role. It, it, and next we have one of my favorite man, the Dag Man and Kim Wayans as Cephas and Reese with the Christmas album. They drove you crazy. They revolutionized, they revolutionized dinner theater with please don't chew with your mouth open. <laughs> and now they got a Christmas album, Steve. And this honestly, I didn't clock this as a kid, but this is now my favorite recurring skit on In Living Color. <laughs> Dude, this is so fucking Dude. funny. Man, and Kim Wayans, man, we've talked about this before. Not enough credit as uh, one of the greatest comedic actresses, man. Uh, 24 minutes of Deck in the Hall, Deck the Halls, 49 minutes of uh, Silent Night. Reese, 
What kind of night you say that was? <laughs> what was we decking? We decking the hall. <laughs> was it holy? <laughs> and not best of all, Steve, you know, if you act now, you can actually receive an eight CD collection that is only of the, their rendition of the 12 Nights of Christmas. So these motherfuckers, they're not short winded, but goddamn, do they put on a show? So. And some chitlins and some pig feet. <laughs> they even lose track of where they're at in that song while they're yeah. singing the song. It's so long. So. What's that, Reese? <laughs> What night you say that was? Was it holy? <laughs> yeah, dude. Dag, I man, Dag might be. There's an. I don't know if you call it physical comedy. It is kind of, but it's just like he does physical comedy. He's, not like he's not falling over and shit, but he has to be one of the funniest people from the '90s. Period. Like just, comedic acting. Just comedic, com- just comedic acting in general. And there, there's definitely. Definitely a tear for that. For like now, I I saw him do stand up at the Improv in Houston, but that was that's not his forte. So I, I still put him in that comedic actor bracket, just like Will Ferrell. Uh, he might have done some stand up and here because he's Will Ferrell, but he's known for being a funny guy playing a role. And those two, uh, the Dagman and Will, they're, they're probably up there like Chris Farley and Jim as far as physical comedy for me. Yeah, I wonder if Dag did improv. Because, I mean, I feel like maybe that's yeah. where how you sort of can do because stand up comedy, it's, even if you're a funny person that acts, there is a high well, level of uh, education that you got to go through to be good at stand up. You know what I mean? So he, that's why he's definitely done. He's definitely done improv. I mean, he he has a master's in Yale in, in acting, man. So he's, oh, he's wow. one of those. Perf- he's a performer. You know what I mean? He he's done Shakespeare. He's done uh, Broadway. He's he's done it all, man. He's done in Living Color. Uh, from that to uh, Handyman or what, what was the shit called? That we, Blank we man. That. Blank man. Yeah. He, <laughs> Not Handyman. <laughs> he, he didn't. He didn't do that one. Yeah, that was Damon. <laughs> but the, it was basically the same kind of guy. In a way, it's just he kind didn't of. Have the, he just effects. didn't go kind that of. extra mile, Steve. He didn't go that. Yeah. This he didn't do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, but I I love that skit too. So, and uh, another recurring skit is, uh, and this is in the early stages, man. Will miss trouble at the museum. Uh, and Kim Caulfield, she plays like this little grade school girl, and it's usually her paired with Jim Carrey. And, um, you know, he's like this nerdish guy. And yeah. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I, I didn't know this was recurring, though. I, I did not like I don't like annoying kids sketches. I hate this. <laughs> Well, I remember seeing this in a couple of scenarios because of the the big butt teacher played by Kim Wayans. Um, uh, she's uh, Mrs. I can't remember her name on here, man, but she's like this bubble butt teacher, uh, like telling the class to behave and shit. Uh, and, you know, Jim Carrey, you look like more more like Cheetah Bobita. Smell your stinky feet. Like <laughs> crap alone. <laughs> Yeah, dude. Edna Penna. Go drop dead. He does a lot. It's just a lot of. <laughs> They're relying on Jim Carrey, and I. It's hilarious you brought up the big butt teacher because my last note is the teacher has got the most ass. So, uh, you know, shout out to that teacher. I wish I had a teacher like that. I'd be paying a lot more attention in class than they are. That's for God. A Matola Khomeini. <laughs> yeah, I didn't care for it, Steve. I didn't care for it. I'm not gonna shit on it, but I didn't care for it. Okay. It- I, I, out of the lineup, it's it's the more forgettable one. Edna Penna, go drop data. Uh, now, my favorite uh, skit of all of this shit is Homie D Clown. This is the first time talking about Homie, and he's Homie Claus. And I think this is the same lineup for the kids every time. Yeah, uh, it's Tommy Davison, David Allen Greer, Kelly Caulfield, and bah, bah, and you know what I appreciate about uh, the their. Uh, portrayals of kids they are all obnoxiously loud in their own way yeah 
Hell yeah. Especially David Allen Greer. They're all like just Dennis really... the Menace, basically, in some way. Exactly. You know, loud and annoying and fucking with you all the time. <laughs> Why don't you have a white beard <laughs> so I can look like a North Pole negative? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Homie, don't play that. What's crazy about uh, the Homie the Clown mm-hmm. sketch in general is that I mean, this one became so famous to the point where, like, my mom was aware of who Homie the Clown was. She knew the joke. Yeah. She loved the character. And my mom is, like, the whitest of white ladies, you know? So this was not up her alley in any way. But she even knew what she didn't watch in Living Color, but she knew who Homie the fucking Clown was. But Yeah, man. I mean, he was a phenomenon, uh, you know, pop cultural <laughs> icon. Uh, just like Urkel, you couldn't avoid it. I don't you, think you knew- so. You, you, I, I remember having a T-shirt, and I, I hope to find that that picture, man. Uh, in second grade, I had a Homie the Clown T-shirt that we got like at J.C. Penny. And, we, and if you got a shirt selling at something like that, Sears or J.C. Penny, you like you, people know about you. You're 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 Nintendo, no. you know. You're Nintendo. So, yeah, I mean, this one in general, the Homie Claws. I love this. I mean, anytime yeah. the the level of. Uh, like martial arts skill that homie has with the sock too i mean you got this guy's like the bruce lee of smacking people with the sock you know i love it yeah when Tommy there's Davis always an extra somebody. like uh movement to it that yeah. you don't expect yeah. you'd be like damn on some bruce lee michelangelo shit yeah, man dude. and like Tommy Davidson asks him what <laughs> dignity is, and he puts a fucking ice cream cone on his head and like slaps it off with his fucking sock. He's like, "Well, yeah, you know how you feel right now. Dignity is the opposite of that." <laughs> and, and then uh, Kelly Caulfield, she's like, "Oh, I want a Malibu, Malibu Barbie with your own condo." <laughs> and, and so Homie gives her a Compton Carlotta and her Section Eight housing and foreclosure. And she's like, "This is a milk carton and a turkey baster with an afro." <laughs> Uh, uh, fucking uh jim carrey's like i want he's like i don't care what you want cave boy (laughs) he gives gives him a fucking stick he says it's sticko the world's greatest toy (laughs) see you could you could play baseball like that fat white boy babe ruth i don't want to play baseball well he's and he says i'm like you could play the piccolo i don't want to play in a band uh, he's like, well, you can march in a band. He's like, oh, I don't better get the marching. <laughs> yeah, dude. Anytime he can just to smack these kids in the. F- I wonder what was at the end of that sock because he didn't hesitate in real life just to smack the fuck out of these people with that sock. So I loved it. I forget what I think Tommy Davidson is just like, doesn't he say something about getting in a gang or something at one point in the skit? Yeah, homie catches him stealing some one of the toys. He's like, man, if you if you wanted something, homie would just give it to you. You can ask. He was like, I got got the money. I'm joining a gang for my initiation. Yo, what initiation? Uh, and I also, whenever he does seem like he's going into something sweet, like he goes into, he breaks into a song. I think you did it at the beginning of the show, but then he'll go into like some black guy PTSD shit and start yeah. going off on these kids too. I mean, classic. Mm-hmm. But you have a special moment with me. You trying to have a special moment with homie? But like the favorite, my is Dag man. Hi, right, homie. <laughs> <laughs> super loud <laughs> I feel like you were trying to get them to laugh you know like I feel like that's like between actors they're just trying to make each other yeah. laugh on camera and shit Farley was notorious for that man he's locking eyes with people and just making weird faces and shit <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah man uh December 23rd in 1992 Sin of a Woman Hoo-ha! premieres in theaters this is such a, I, I, this is not a movie I watched a lot. I've seen, this is the one where he's a blind guy and yeah. aren't they trying to like take away, he's in some sort of legal battle. Am I right? Well, uh, Chris O'Donnell, he plays a student at some like preppy school and uh, the guy, um, Scotty, uh, who passed away, he's in the movie. This is one of his like first acting roles. Uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. 
and he plays the the guy that's in the frat. He's the frat bro. He's a dick. His parents got money. So they pull a prank on their teacher, who's also an asshole. And the, like the movie is basically about like who did it. And like nobody wants to own up to like the prank that they pulled on the teacher. And so Chris O'Donnell, he's enlisted to uh, escort this this blind man who's apparently a colonel. Uh, and he was uh, Al Pacino. He was in the service, uh, but he's not telling him the real story. And Al Pacino is just this like he this cantankerous old man. He's angry at the world. He's giving Chris O'Donnell shit like while he's escorting him and, you know, like helping him out for this weekend. And so he gets to meet Al Pacino's uh, family. Uh, like his uh, nephews, his, his brother, and his rea their reaction to Al Pacino's character is kind of like telling him the story of like they really don't like Al Pacino. Yeah. And at some yeah, at some point, Al Pacino's like, you know, uh, I'm going to kill myself. So this there's this uh, conflict between Chris O'Donnell, Al Pacino, uh, and like him trying to like stop him from killing himself because he's really like not the guy that he portrayed himself to be initially. Yeah. Um, he actually uh, got one of the guys killed in the army. And uh, it's one of the things that kind of like led to him being blind. He was playing with grenades and like that led to him being blind. There was like a blast. And one of the one of his uh, guys died, man. Yeah. Gee, OK, well, I don't remember the detail, but I like this is where because I think an impersonation of Al Pacino that's very famous now for anybody, maybe the hack impersonation is going Hoo -ha! Yeah! Hoo -ha! like it's, that it started with this. So that's where yeah. this came from. So. Yeah, I mean, this was Al Pacino. This is when you he just started getting paid to be Al Pacino. You know, he became it was like Nick Cage, where he's just portraying like a caricature of himself. Um, but I didn't it, clock this movie. And I here's somebody. I here's my Sandra, one of my Sandra Bullocks from the '90s. Steve, Chris O'Donnell. Tell me a oh, good wow. Chris O'Donnell movie, and I'll give you ten dollars. I I'll have to look. I'm not too hip to Chris O'Donnell like that. I, I do know he was Robin. Uh, that's his other claim to fame, which and, it, and it's one of the most panned Batmans. Um, and but that's not fair to him because the other people that were in that were actually good. Um, yeah. That I like. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to dispute you on that. I man. think he you was in every... ER the show, maybe. Or no, that's not even this guy. So fuck this guy. Fuck Chris O'Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> And I shitted on this because this is the one that got him the 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 Oscar over Denzel's uh, Malcolm X, and you know that's my favorite Denzel uh, How? portrayal, man. How in the fuck did this I, be? It's just wild. I mean, people just well, want to dick suck Al Pacino. Well, watching it, I watched it recently. It's available on stream, and I, I get it, man. Oh. And it's. It's also it's also because they never gave it to him. Like we talked about this, the Oscar. It's like this whole like, oh, I owe you kind of deal. Like we didn't give it to you for uh, Dog Day Afternoon. We didn't give it to you for any of the Godfather's uh, uh, Scarface. You probably should at least got nominated for that. So it's like, OK. And, and he played this role well, man, because he's showing you um, versatility. Yeah. I mean, the motherfucker yeah, you know, is a good actor for sure, but oh, hands down, man. I don't like um, if Al, in Al Pacino's like lexicon of movies. This is, I mean, has to be, and this is one of the people again. He won an Oscar, but to me, this is like one of his worst movies. So that's wild. You're even saying you I, liked it, kind. Of. It seems like you kind of actually kind of liked the movie. I, I did, man. Um, it, it's very long, longer than I thought it was. Uh, have you watched it in full? I mean, like I said, this is a movie I'm sure that I've seen in full, but never in one sitting. You know what I mean? Like it'd be on HBO and I'd see like the beginning of it and be like, oh, OK, maybe because it was so long, I just stopped watching it. But it's never something I like owned or ever watched just in one sitting. No. Yeah, maybe, maybe I should. Because it it doesn't require much from Chris O'Donnell. Uh, most of the legwork is Al Pacino. Um, and he, yeah, Chris O'Donnell is kind of like the, the stalemate, uh, the, the blank face, just kind of being a kid. Uh, He's in, a straight in college. man, basically. The straight man, yeah. yeah. And then it's a, it's a young Philip Seymour Hoffman, man. And, and I know you fucks with him. Yeah, fuck um, yeah. That's weird. But Phil, you'd see, that's what's funny, sort of like uh, in the 90s, these guys that became like more famous and more maybe even more dramatic in some way. You would see them in these like little bit parts, like another guy, Philip Seymour Hoffman, I'm sure. But 
uh, like Jack Black, you would see like a young Jack Black playing like these side parts, like a, a frat boy in this movie, for mm-hmm. example, or just like a guy's friend or something. So that's wild. I didn't know Philip Seymour Hoffman was in it. Yeah, I think you'd like it, man. Uh, you know, I'm willing to, you know what, Steve, I'm willing to give it a blunt. That's my time limit or a joint. If I will watch, I'll sit down and watch any movie. I don't care what it is. You got yeah. enough time till that's done. And if I don't, if I'm still not in, I'm turning it off. And I feel like that's adequate. That's enough time. Usually you're into a movie for sure. that time. So yeah, I'll yeah, do it. I, I, you're saying it's good. And we, I'm on record. I mean, I trust your movie taste more than most people. Yeah. So I'm, maybe I'll give it a shot. Yeah, man, I, I really think you'll enjoy it, man. But uh, in December 23rd, 1994, Little Women premiered in theaters, and uh, I, I like me some Susan Sarandon's, but I am not fucking with this shit. It looks just so fucking uh, how we said about that Brad Pitt movie last week. Oh, oh my Legends God. of the it Fall, just... yeah. See, yeah. They, Steve, this movie's been made many times. Little Women, you know, this is something that's been made in many ways and many iterations, and it's just not for us. I don't, I don't think anybody would expect us to like it, and it's just not, I don't even know what Little Women's about. I know it's a book. I know they made movies about it, but I don't know dick about it. So it, it I'm sure it's how it looks, man. And look at all those pictures I just showed. Uh, it just looks very Hallmark uh, Lifetime movie of the week. I, I just, you know, I don't have ovaries. I'm sorry. What, Mark? The checks party mix is for the guests? Good grief. Don't worry. Now it's so easy. We can make more in 10 minutes. I can't even make toast. Just mix up the checks and the seasoning, shake it in a bag, and pop it in the microwave. They're not coming? We can't eat the checks party mix? All right. Checks party mix. It's so easy and so good. Well, something that was intended for us was Street Fighter, which also premiered on ni- in 1994 on December 23rd, mm. uh, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, Raul Julia, Damien Chapa, and Byron Mann, and also Miguel Nunez. Pretty Ricky, what they called him. <laughs> this was a movie that, first of all, just to sort of set the tone of this whole discussion, before this movie came out, I mean, everyone knows what Street Fighter the video game is. And I feel like I have memories of going to a gas station that had the Street Fighter arcade game, putting like the quintessential arcade memory, putting quarters in, playing it with your buddies. I'm that old. We're that old. So when this came about, I don't remember how far into our life it was like in terms of like the video games. I'm sure there was many more video games made of Street Fighter by the time the movie came out. But I was so excited when they announced this was going to come out because I would love the video game. And what's wild is this. I mean, I think these two video games, people compare them all the time from our generation, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. You were one or the other. Maybe you like both, but they both made movies. I think they came out in the same year. I think Kendra told me they did. Mortal Kombat was 95. It wasn't. Summer. Okay. Well, (laughs) anywho. Both fighting games. I was pumped for both movies. And this one, I mean, dude, when they announced and you saw what it was, Jean-Claude as Guile, does it make sense? No. But in the 90s, Time Cop as Guile? Are you kidding me? It's going to happen. Kickboxer? Yeah. yeah. And I don't remember. I, I definitely saw it in the theater. I don't remember the experience, but when this movie came out on video, I would get it from the library. I would rent it all the time. Very much. I must have just loved shitty movies, Steve, because this movie is not good. Let's, let's go on record yeah. now. It's not a, like in terms of an actual mechanics of a movie, it ain't good. But no, I love it. <laughs> and, and the critics agreed, man. I mean, <laughs> the it, critics it was... agreed. <laughs> The, it was universally panned, but the one shining light was Raul Julia, man, playing in Bison. Just and, going uh, you, you know, so over the top, dude. The most comic book of comic book villains and just, I mean, hitting it out of the park. Yeah. And, you know, only, I am not going to say only he could do it, man, but a guy of his stature with his expertise can make it formidable. 
Well, because here's, I know he didn't like fight a lot in the movie, but here's the thing. You got to have a guy who can sort of like big dick around and have like a physical presence. Because all this movie is, is it's just a bunch of ripped motherfuckers walking around, posing, flexing, mm-hmm. and eventually fighting. But well, the thing the thing I didn't like about this movie, we can go through the story. I don't know how much story we want to go through because there's not much, but the the amount of for a movie called Street Fighter, there really isn't a lot of fighting in it. You know, <laughs> when you look at the t- the whole time of the movie, there the the amount of fighting in the movie Street Fighter's got to be like a good fifteen percent of the movie, if that. And d- I didn't know that Jean Claude Van Gaal was about that that party life, man, because he said he had a ten thousand dollar a week cocaine habit. Hoo-ha! I, I guess you had to be on something to do this goddamn movie. Yeah, dude. And that's why. I mean, I knew he was a party animal, and I mean, this was in the night. This was right in the pocket of his success. I mean, this is when he was probably at the height of his fame. You know, for sure. Because he's now. This is a kids' and, movie. This isn't blood sport or kickboxer or any of the other movies that he. You know, adult movies. This is him getting his chance to be in somewhat of a kid's movie, I guess, or movie that kids are going to watch. Wait, what, was he in Kickboxer or was that? I'm getting him confused with Sasha, uh, uh, cousin uh, Cody, because I know he was in something like yeah, that. Yeah, fucking, like, he was in Kickboxer. I mean, I'm sure the he, Sasha Cody guy was also, hold on, I mean, I'm going to look now because now I'm scared, but. Sasha Mitchell? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Because Kickboxer is the one where he's in like Thailand hitting trees and uh, then like the glass fight at the end. He fights that dude and they put like glass on their fucking mitts, I think. I, I, yeah, I, man. Yeah, he's in Kickboxer 1, which is in 1989. Okay. Kickboxer 2, okay. I think, might be what's his face. Sasha uh, Mitchell. Okay. Yeah. Here's the thing, though, Steve. I don't know if casting Jean Claude Van Damme, the muscles from Brussels, for a guy who's supposed to be essentially Captain America, is the best choice. Because there's a lot of like French sounding shit coming out of Guile's mouth. And it just makes me laugh every time I say, when he starts shit talking uh, bison, there's a lot of like, I'm going to get you bison. Like, oh, it's like, that doesn't uh, sound like Captain America. <laughs> Right, dude, you 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 fighting the service for the United States? Like, we're, I'm from Sheboygan. I'm a legion. I'm, yeah. from, I'm from Sheboygan, <laughs> Wisconsin. I'm okay, from, Bison. I'm from Idaho. I'm from the I'm from the plains of Idaho. <laughs> oh, don't you know? But I mean, the it, movie. What this movie does good is, you know, basically, I feel like what the onus was on this movie was there's a bunch of fighters in Street Fighter. They all got to be in this movie, and your job is to say their names, have them in the movie, and then at some point, Bison and Guy will have to fight. That's all we get, really. And I mean, they yeah. do a good job of introducing all of the p all of the the names that you remember from Street Fighter within like a good five minutes of the movie starting. You know, yeah. Look at and, that. You know, of, of course, Ken and Ryu. Um, you know, the guy that they had playing uh, E Honda. Uh, I feel like that's cultural appropriation because I, I thought that E Honda was supposed to be Japanese. He's a sumo wrestler, uh, but he's played by a Samoan guy. And I remember the Samoan guy. He was in an episode of Jamie Foxx show where he played like a, a Hollywood actor. This was in the early seasons. I want to say season one when Jamie was trying to break into uh, Hollywood or whatever. But yeah, man. He was um, also in 51st Dates as the cook in the Hawaiian joint that Adam Sandler met Drew Barrymore in. He was okay. always like an intimidating fat guy. And I get just if I'm in white America being like sumo wrestler. Yeah, you can pull that off. But yeah, I think you're right. You know, maybe that is a cultural appropriation. But I feel like there's a lot of that going on in this movie because the guy on oh, your yeah. left side that's next to Ryu, who's playing the Native American character, T-Hawk. I mean, that might yeah. be David Chokachev. I'm not sure. That's just some guy from Beverly Hills. <laughs> man, I didn't even clock in T-Hawk, man. Yeah. And I, I will say this. Uh, Ken and Ryu, <clears throat> I'll take this Ken and Ryu over that double dragon with fucking Scott Wolf and the other motherfucker oh. that looked like. 
Ryu, yeah. I mean, they killed Ryu. That guy, you're outstanding. Ken, I feel like that guy could work at fucking uh, Home Depot or something. I didn't really buy him as a badass, but he was Damien still, Choppa? He's, yeah, he's all right. That's Damien Choppa. Yeah, that's a badass name, yeah. Damien Choppa. <laughs> yeah, that is more, that's more badass than him, but uh yeah. he was good he was he was okay but my favorites i mean obviously i do enjoy me some john claude van damme so we all loved him we love ryu but future um pop star kylie minogue is in this looking yeah. so sexy as cammy so fucking hot yeah, she did man and i i'm not too privy on kylie minogue but apparently she's the like the highest selling female artist in all of australia the whole fucking continent i thought she was from the uk but okay i, I mean she was a she was a worldwide phenomenon like, i think maybe in the 2000s but she is very fucking famous for being a singer um and unfortunately this was her introduction into being a movie actor i think maybe and mm. uh she killed the part but I don't know if people clock that she was a good actor. I mean, she played a hot British chick, so I, you yeah. know, I don't know how big of a stretch it was. Um, but basically, this movie is M. Bison's trying to take over the world. He's pulling like a full-on Hitler, and uh, he's got hostages. Uh, and he, they, the basically the world has seventy-two hours to pay him. I think it's like 40 billion or 20 billion dollars. Like it's an insane amount, even for 90s. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's very much that Austin Powers, like 20 I was billion just th- dollars. Yeah. Dr. Evil. Huh. And uh Raul Julia killing it as M. Bison. He's kill. I mean, this motherfucker's killing people. Like they basically intro this through like news uh clips. And he's taken over the world, Steve. M. Bison's about to pull some fucking straight Hitler shit. How many doctors and nurses have you killed this week? How many children have you orphaned? You you get them, Van Dam Guile, Jean Claude Guile. That's the other thing Guile, that I man. loved about this movie that I wrote down. How badass would it be? I mean, war sucks, blah blah blah. But if the dueling generals or heads of each army of these like battling factions, instead of being silent, just like in the background, are on TV like shit talking each other. Cause like Guy will get on and be like, I'm coming for you, Bison. I'm coming. And then Bison will get on his feet and be like, Oh, Guy, oh, fuck you. I'm going to kill some people now. Ha ha ha. Very, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It's it makes war a lot WWE more entertaining. Yeah. You know, I'd be tuning in a lot more. If Schwarzkopf was in like the 90s, like, I'm coming for you, Saddam, you piece of shit, pansy. <laughs> Very WWF promo ish. It man. is. Uh, I mean, it is. Know. It's got that energy to it. Colin Powell hops on. Ah, we're going to take over Iraq. We're going to take over Iran. So you to kill my father. <laughs> Istanbul, we coming for you. <laughs> uh, so uh, somebody covering the war in this movie is Chun Li, who at first we just think is some hot to trot news anchor with a sumo wrestler and a badass, uh, just like tough guy, like crew behind her covering this war. But turns out Chun Li's an assassin slash uh, martial arts black belt, I guess. And she's trying to kill Bison behind the scenes, but nobody knows that. She's just covering the war and uh, also getting sexually harassed by Guile every once in a while, too. Yeah, and she does look sexy in her getup, man. Look at that. Yeah. She, <sighs> it's not that it's not the, the uh, classic blue, because I feel like everyone else kind of got their their get up. But they get yeah. her like this red dress, like uh prostitute outfit that i i mean i love it i love that but she's she kills this in this movie she's not a she's not a guile or jean claude actor in this she actually does a good job too i mean we're shitting on the movie but there's some there's some bright spots man i'd probably say she's my favorite female video game character of all time man i actually gotta say in street fighter i love street fighter i played it a lot uh cammy the british chick I, I, she was one of my favorites to use. I, I was unstoppable with her, Guile, and Ryu. I think everybody's unstoppable with Ryu, though. So, 
Pretty much, man. And, uh, you know, not enough spinning tie kick. Uh, you know, I, I wish there was some more video game reference, uh, you know, doing some kind of like, uh, you know, what's the thing where she like does the with her, oh, like the hurricane her kick thing. That's just like the hurricane. Over kick, yeah. That's the thing. There's so little fighting in the movie that I mean, they give you some hints at it. You know, Jean-Claude Van Damme does like the sonic kick thing at the end. Yeah. Ryu doesn't throw a fireball, but I think they allude to it because in a fight, he does like the move and then the screen flashes because he hits a guy with that. You don't see a fireball. So like, I'm with you. I feel like if you were expecting to see like a, a Street Fighter 2 fight on screen, you don't really get that other than some lightning shooting out of Raul Julia's fingertips at a certain point. And I, I also got to say this ball rogs haircut fucking bothers me. It's the dumbest fucking thing ever. And it serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I, I hated it in the movie. And I like, apparently the backstory is they patterned it after Mike Tyson. And I guess the Asian people did not know how to draw black man haircuts because uh, even in the video game, there's like this, uh, uh, Carl Winslow uh, <laughs> yeah. me- receding hairline thing. <laughs> Like, but it's properly it's properly lined up around the fucking Eddie Munster bullshit. It's like it's like a fucking hand, like a big ass like predator hand, just fucking glopped, and you just try to fucking trace around it. <laughs> I mean, it don't look good, and I feel bad that they made the guy in the movie do it because clearly they cut it and made him get this bullshit ass haircut. And I got to say, just in terms of like the character itself, just never cared for it. Steve never cared for Balrog at all. It just wasn't there. for Yeah. It, you know, while we're on this tangent, they always make the black character in both in, in all video games. Like I hate Balrog and I hate Jax. Jax you know, like is Jax, whack. though. Jax is so fucking whack. I told you this shit back in uh, in Bowling Green, back when we were playing in, in on the Napoleon days, man. Uh, I think you had one of those Mortal Kombat. Oh yeah, I, I definitely a, did. Yeah, I remember going on a tear back then, man. And I was like, dude, Jax is he fucking sucks. I I, I want to kill Jax. He's fucking. I like why why does he have to be the weakest? Of, that's his fucking weak ass fatality. Hey, they just what, what that. I mean, they fucking, here's the thing in Mortal Kombat, we'll just sidetrack Tally real quick. I like Jax's, like the visual. They made him look a guy with Colossus arms and a regular body, and just a ripped ass body. It's pretty cool. Cyborg arms. But the character, I never like playing with him in the game. But I will say, because um, speaking on my love of these games, I actually still play Mortal Kombat. I think they, they're making good Mortal Kombat games now. And Jax in the new ones has a daughter, Steve, Jackie Briggs. And she's actually one of the best characters in the game. And she has these Sonic ar- or whatever, bionic arms. too. Yeah. And uh, she might have uh, made oh. you a believer in just like the Briggs bloodline sidetracking Sally out of it. Okay, well, his female offspring happens to be the best character, but the black man still sucks. You're right. They're playing you in these games, and they're playing Balrog just in general because they made. I'm sure they did my like make him after Mike Tyson, um, but he sucked in the game, and he sucks in this movie because really all he's here to do is go, "Hey, Lee, you okay, Lee?" He says that that's his basic line. He has three line reads in this movie, and it's always, you okay, Lee? Gotcha, Lee. We here for you, Lee. Done. Cut. We're cut. We're a wrap on Balrog. He's good. That's it. And I will say the actor who portrays Balrog in the movie, probably one of the greatest Hollywood names of all time, man. It, it sounds like a woman of the evening. His, his name, he's played by Grand L. Bush. Grand Bush. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he's a veteran character actor. He actually has a background in Shakespeare as well, man. Uh, his parents were actors. Uh, he's based out of Los Angeles and he was in Good Times. He was in uh, a couple of other shows and movies. Uh, but yeah, man, Grand Bush. I feel like he was always like a cop on the force. He was never like the main actor in something, but he was always like a guy in a movie that was like the, the partner of somebody or a guy who worked in the office or some shit, you know? 
Well, he he first broke in the movie Colors and Dennis Hopper liked him so much in that movie that he brought him on. Uh, and I think they've collaborated thrice. OK. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he, he had some some business with Dennis Hopper. And uh, yeah, man, straight out of L.A., I believe Compton to be exact. But he just gets very sweaty in this movie and he does like punch maybe one guy, I think. There's all with a, a stupid punch. fucking haircut. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it irks the fuck out of me. Like, wh- there's no grown man who is a lot. And I know the those '90s babies. They're they're coming up with weird shit with their head, with the Hey Arnold and all of that shit. But man, I don't think this will ever fucking pass for cool. Ever, ever, ever. I don't give a fuck. If it's you like go to Brazil, something they'd give the black American gladiator. You know, it's just like it's somewhat flashy, but it's also just not. It doesn't make sense when you look at his head. You know, like when you draw a character on a piece of paper and it's 2D, maybe that makes sense. But mechanically, whenever I'm wondering, like when they did the haircut for the movie, if he was like, man, what the fuck? Fucking gotta try to fuck all these Thai bitches looking like this. Hell no, this shit ain't fly. This shit ain't player. And uh, in Bison, I noticed that he's got like this John Wayne Gacy like <clears throat> art exhibit uh, with like self portraits of himself. Uh, I don't know if you you clocked that. In, oh yeah, man. but I dude, yeah, they because there are some weird like that way because at some point he Chun Li gets captured because she's trying to kill him because he killed her dad in some in some war, and when yeah. we get to that part of the movie, one thing a player line that he says because one thing that they give M Bison in this movie which makes absolutely no sense are these like Shakespearean villain lines uh in this movie filled with like <laughs> uh jean-claude van damme quotes like i'm gonna get you and shit like that he's like for this day and uh, that i killed your father that was the biggest day of your life but for me it was tuesday shit like that where it's like very cool yeah. badass villain lines and uh his room is insane because not only does he have those John Wayne Gacy, like Hitler pictures that he's painted of himself and of him and all these like weird things. He's got like a bone chandelier and uh, the guy's got a pimp ass fucking like boudoir. Like I'm guaranteeing you he's fucking bitches in that room, Steve, but the le- oh, no. I don't know who they are. They've got some problems, maybe some daddy issues, but the actual vibe, I mean, if you tr- want to have, like, a villain fuck room, this guy's got the room, Steve. He's got the the little, like, skull shit. He's got, like, a little panic room where he can go and, like, bust off <laughs> behind a glass door. He's got – he's even has a cool – this is something I want as an adult. A sex he, chamber? Not, not the sex chamber, but just, like, the badass, like – liquor cabinet that has like these cool glass bottles that you have like the concoctions in he's got some very player-esque um accessories but yeah i don't want like the nazi hitler fuck room i don't need that you know i don't need that level of it with the fucking gimp chair where you can gas bitches and fucking sit behind the glass wall and just be like (laughs) Very I will just stand behind this door and <laughs> stare at your feet for three hours. <laughs> I can see you. I know, but I'm about to hit the gas. <laughs> and, and, and we also see Blanca. I get, I, I'm assuming this is the backstory of Blanca. This is why he's green. He was one of Guile's uh, army buddies or whatever, and he got captured uh, and taken into custody and and made into a, a monster of a man in, in a some kind <laughs> yeah. of lab. Well, I mean, that's the thing with a movie like this, where you're there's like intellectual property associated with the video game, like a Blanca that to my knowledge in the game, he's from Brazil. So I think in the okay. movie that, you know, to make a movie out of it, he's like a Hispanic buddy of Giles who got captured by Bison and is now being turned into this monster that, when he comes out of the chamber, Steve, I mean, he looks like <laughs> he don't he don't look good. Let's put it like that. Yeah. He like he he busts out the door with a flying kick, and uh, Guile he almost shoots Blanca, 
And, uh, you know, I, I guess the scientist turns out to be Dawson. Yeah. Again, from, like from they're just I'm... trying to make like a story out of characters. Like when you all it is is a character in a video game, it, you don't need much, you know. Yeah. But in this, yeah, Dalsim is a, a a scientist who's a genius, but is being held captive by Bison in the in the depths of his um, facility, being made to create these super soldiers. That I guess eventually Bison's going to have a bunch of these, but Blanca yeah. is the first one, and it, the whole process of making Blanca is hilarious. They take a they take a soldier, they put him in some sort of clockwork orange booth and make him yeah. watch bad stuff, Steve. So essentially like we would become evil super soldiers because all we did in college was watch fucked up videos. And that's really all they do. They put them on, <laughs> they put them on consumptionjunction.com yeah. and they just make him watch all the videos on that website. That's how you make Blanca mentally, physically. I don't know. They're pumping steroids in there. They got a, some kind of a, a computer screen showing you the the, the evolution. Re revenge porn, <laughs> scat porn. Uh, 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 a senator fucking offing himself at a, at a public meeting. Yeah, like really aggressive porno, a couple of dead bodies spursed in there, you know, a couple of war footage uh, documentaries. Scheiser. And then eventually Dalsim about i think like halfway through turns the the feed into like um bambi and birthday videos and cake and happy things and butterflies and, yeah, <laughs> yeah and babies and shit <clears throat> but also i got to say one thing i found funny in this movie i mean there's many we're kind of just like parsing over it but one thing at one point bison is like running through his plan with DJ and Zangief, who you see in this this photo behind you, and yeah. they're like his basically his his master plan. If he gets the way his way, is that he's going to take over the world, but then he's going to have like this theme park that he's called Bisonopolis. That's just yeah. like a tribute to this very like a North Korean dictator thing where it's just like he's going to create this whole Disney world dedicated to himself called Bisonopolis, which I just thought was funny. And mo like yeah. most 80s villains, he has like a 3D representation of it that he's like, this is my dream. This is Bisonopolis. And it's just like this shitty 3D model on a desk. And even DJ is like, yeah. I don't know, Bison. I don't know, man. It's just crazy. I mean, it's weird, but I just thought that was hilarious that this like villain who's trying to take over the world actually has like a 3D model of his his master chalet or whatever the fuck it is that he hey, he, he stayed up all night working on that. Yeah, thing. dude. Very bizarre. But um, you know, Guile is just this unstoppable force. He's a badass. Uh, he not only is he trying to take over or trying to beat Bison because he's trying to take over the world, but he's out, he's trying to go after his buddy um, Blanca, who's captured as well. Like that's also in his mind. So yeah, we get to this part where you know it's it's do or die, and uh, by or Guile has to mount this offensive on Bison's facility in this place called Shadowloo, which is like this criminal haven and shit that bison's taking yeah. over um so we get a funny moment where uh the guy who was the villain in jurassic park 2 and was also the villain in ace ventura 2 is like a shitty sniveling like politician um and right before the offensive is about to mount and they're about like to you know, take bison down. The government is actually going to pay bison off. And the sniveling politician is like, you can't do this. You got to stop. And bison yeah. or a guy was like, we're going, I don't give a fuck. And just basically does a military coup and takes all the forces, the UN forces or whatever they are uh, against this guy's will. But I thought that was another funny moment that the villain in Ace Ventura too. Uh, is like a mini villain in this also. So whoever that guy is, another king of the 90s. 
But like when Guile is also like taken off in the boat, all of these gunshots, these automatic rounds are just fucking hailing into his boat. And he's just coasting along as if he's on his way to Cedar Point or some shit. It's like he's just right. It's the same boat. Remember that Hulk Hogan show where he had like a speedboat? Thunder Beach. Thunder Beach or Thunder yeah. in Paradise or some shit like that. Some shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the same boat. And all like here's the plan, Steve. Guile and Cammy and T Hawk are going to jump in this armored out boat and just drive right into the teeth of it all. Um, it's basically like the X Wing thing in Star Wars. Like they're just going down this river, and like you said, they're they're impervious to bullets. He can. They're sitting there watching. He's watching like a video of this fucking like a family video while they're doing this. Uh, and I don't remember what the exact plan was, but basically, at some point while this is happening, Bison knows he's coming, and he then instead of the because the bullets obviously do nothing. Uh, he gets in like this weird video game chair and plays the, he uses the fucking street fighter sticks and starts launching um, mines in the, that are in the water in this river and starts playing a video game and blows up the boat. So it isn't a, a bomb proof boat, Steve, but it is fucking bulletproof and it's ridiculous. Jeez. And like, <laughs> Whoever made that machine, it's probably made by stormtroopers, man. Like all those fucking bullets, <laughs> those rounds going off and just nothing. I just love how in movies you can have these things set up where it's like miles and miles of river and they have these automatic machine guns that just come out of the ground and just are just unloading. Like how many bullets do you think that thing shot at this fucking boat? Dude, that thing had like 11 fucking rounds in 11, it, man. Yeah. It was but by the time they passed it, I like they show a, a quick shot of it and the thing still looked fully full. Oh, I mean, the thing like, was ready. It was like an unlimited, it had unlimited I, ammunition. I Steve. Like, <laughs> and nothing was registering. Nothing was connected. That that, <clears throat> this, that didn't sit well with me. It's like, oh my God, and Bison, you could afford better shit. So they blow but, the um, boat up and they bail and they get in this fucking river that I sure get. They got fucking that. Remember, you know, that worm that goes up people's yeah. dicks in the Amazon. They got that. They got all that shit. Um, but they infiltrate M. Bison's fucking base, which when you watch this movie for somebody who's like a, a, a Hitler level warlord, pretty yeah. easy to infiltrate his base, Steve. If you can, mm -hmm. if you can and kick a couple guys and rappel down a fucking grate that is very easy access that nobody else seems to know about, that's all you need. But dude, like not only that, he gets to him. He gets to M. Bison, like the the main guy that's in charge of all of this shit. Somehow, some way, Guile is able to get a hold of that man in person, and he does like this dance, dance revolution style style kick that I have never seen from anyone. Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, uh, Michael Jai White, nobody. But it's like this break dance esque uh, sweep kick, and just like only Jean Claude. I think, they, I think maybe in Ninja Turtles 2 they redid it in some sort of a break dance. It, you're right. It's like a break dance move that he's turned into a martial arts move. Yeah. Fucking badass. I mean, that's Jean Claude, dude. He's a ballerina and he'll fucking slap you in the fucking mouth. So and, and I will say this. I I'll take this Jean Claude Van Gaal over video game battle because I never it was always Ken Ryo and even Chun Lee or even Blanca. Sometimes he Honda. I'd never fuck with Guile. He's just so fucking Sandra Bullock of a fucking video game character to me. Well, of you're course, supposed to be the guy. Well, of course, Steve, when this movie came out, <clears throat> they made a version of Street Fighter, the video game with the did. movie characters in it, because this is a deep cut. Back in the day, I couldn't afford to buy the systems. They would come out like the Sega Saturns, those type of systems. But you could yeah. rent them. And I do remember me and my buddies rented a Sega Saturn from Video Connection. And we rented this game. And that was the character I played with, Steve. Jean-Claude Van Gyle. Fucking best character in the game, obviously. And I just thought that was cool. It was, that's how easy it was to make those games. They just were like, here, stand like this. We got you, you know? So... Because I, be I believe it came out that same year in 94. Whenever Sega Saturn, whatever the, the systems were that were aligned with in that generation of video games, that's when this shit came out. And uh, you can fact check that. I'm sure if we check the date, 
probably oh, yeah. right around the same time. So, so that guile you admit, man, is better than like the original guile with the fucking. Mm-hmm. Well, I got a my favorite character in Street Fighter is Guile because of that weird wacky hair. I used to like to draw these really? characters. I used to like Damn. to draw them, and I just always thought he had cool fun. I mean, it's ridiculous. Even in the game, it's like supposed to be a mil a military flat top, but it's like it's like a white guy high top fade to the mat, like that's been turned into some sort yeah. of a tetrahedron shape or some shit. I don't know. I, I I really feel like Japanese the animators they didn't get a full grasp of our culture. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. there. Yes, there are white men with flat tops, but like I never seen them like that. Uh, maybe now from some of these '90s babies. Yes, there are black men with short haircuts, and we line them up at the around the edges. But shit, not like a fucking a block test. <laughs> The Balrog ink blot haircuts, dude. Yeah, dude. Now, what do you see on this? But here's what I'm gonna say because I keep staring at it, and we've been shitting on their interpretation of all the characters. DJ as Joanna Man, hilarious. But the one that they nailed in every way, in the in the the voice, the look, the everything is Zangief. Because that yeah, guy, this, I don't know if they fucking made this man for this movie, like in a lab someplace, but he is Zangief. I think this is the yeah, guy, yeah. maybe. This Eric Montross, uh, Greg Ostertag looking for Yeah, yeah dude. Man. This guy, I mean, yeah. that guy killed it. Uh, the last, like, all the fighting we get is in, like, the last 20 minutes. All the street fights. There's no street fighting in this movie, except in a very small uh, uh, part in the b- middle where Ken and Ryu go to try to sell some guns and shit. Um, they kick a little ass. But I, th- I that's another interesting thing that I didn't really like. I kind of noted that in most times when they make a Street Fighter movie or like cartoon, or even in the games, to me, Ken, uh, Ryu and Ken were always sort of the main characters of the of the show. Like they're the interesting ones. They always are sort of the yeah. the centerpieces, and everything else is built out around it. In this, yeah, they went the away from that. Like Ken and Ryu are just sort of some guys who, in the movie, when you are introduced to them, are like scumbags. They're gun mm-hmm. runners and con men that are trying to con yeah. these fucking thieves out of some money, uh, and then they obviously are you know sort of get their redemption at the end, and they are badass fighters. But I just thought that was interesting how. It's like the game, the uh, Ryu, I think, is what they started it all off on. You know what I mean? Like, that feels like right. he's the character. But in this, they just said, fuck it. Guy, we're getting John claude Van Damme. Who can he play? Uh, Guile, I guess. That's about all we can do. So, <laughs> Wow. And I think that maybe he would have been more apt to play Ryu. But I, I did like the Ryu. Oh, they Ryu have, should have uh, been fucking the guy. Like, I mean, if they have to go with like the look visually, I mean, fucking Jean Claude ain't playing an Asian Ryu character, but he could have played Ken, you know, yeah. and done it that way. But they they did a few things in this well, and I feel like just just putting Jean Claude at the front of the movie was really only to get butts in the seats. They could have gotten any buff guy to play Guile, but. They said, fuck it. He can't speak a lick of real English when he said he just has this like funny French accent. But fuck it. We're going to put him at the front on the poster. We're going to make Raul Julia the villain of this fucking movie. Who saw that coming? But I, I just feel like they were moves to make money. But I loved him because I can't I can't picture anybody else in these movies. So his roundhouses are entertaining. Yeah. Give him a check. Yeah, give him and, a check. Give I I I'm gonna just disagree with you though, because you don't like Sagat, but I just thought they made that guy who played him in this movie is a good baddie in 90s movies. He was always like an Asian asshole in a lot of things, and he did a good in this too. So shout out. And also, how much fucking I... pussy do you think the guy that played Vega got? Uh Vega. You know, Vega's a bitch, and he got his ass beat in here. Uh, Ryu beat his claws off. And without his claws, he's, I, like I said, when I was nine years old, you're, you're a bitch without your claws, Vega. And, and that's what we saw when Ryu beat them claws off. I mean, Ken, was it Ken? Somebody fucking put his goddamn face in a fucking furnace door. I mean, they burned his beautiful face, Steve. 
But the yeah, other thing should. that this movie did that they do it right at the end, but they give everybody a chance to everybody who plays one of the characters from the game gets to do their signature victory pose at one point in the movie, most of them at the end, but like Vega, it, when he's in that little street fighting scene, he does his little flip yeah. and like little fucking weird salute thing that he does in the video game too. So I thought that was cool. Like clearly there was some love of the video game from the yeah. people that made it, but there's only so much you can do to make an actual movie out of a video game, you know? And, and I, I partially blame this on the lack of technology at the time. This was December 23rd, 1994. And so, I mean, who knows what they could do with CGI technology now, man, and uh, actually implement some of those uh, otherworldly moves like, like you could easily pull off the spinning tie kick now oh yeah uh, you know, but yeah, i mean they got know? some of them and i i would have loved to see like a fireball but i mean most of this was like just really just realistic fighting and i think most of them got and it didn't look too bad but like i don't like special effects heavy movies i hate it for most part because they overdo it but when they have raul julia doing Peter Pan level wire work in this movie to do like the M Bison moves. It does look a little ridiculous, you know. Dude, I feel if you're uh, recreating a video game movie, special effects is a must. It's it, it's a necessary evil. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah. Unless you're doing, even if you are doing a Grand Theft Auto uh, reincarnation, man, like there's to make it like the best you can possibly like, it has to be implemented. So with this, not one Hadouken, not one Hadouken, Matt. I mean, like, uh, Steve, they in the fight, uh, in the end, when Ryu and Ken are fighting, there is a moment where I think he might even say it and you just can't hear it, but he does okay. this and you see like a blue flash on the screen when he hits the guy. So I think that was their way of doing it. Maybe they didn't have any fucking money to do special effects and that's why some of these things didn't happen, but um, I think in terms of a movie about a video game uh, is, has there ever been a good one other than may, people might say like the new mortal Kombat? I, I do. I liked the old, the first mortal Kombat movie. I like them both. I didn't like the second one. I don't think anyone. Likes no, the but it was, it was, a mo it was just like a cash grab, but <clears throat> that first yeah. one, I feel like that's the thing. There's not a lot of good, uh, versions of video game movies maybe now we're getting closer to that but like in our time when these movies came out you're to right compare mortal kombat and street fighter i feel like if you look at mortal kombat objectionably and just like it, the quality is just about the same you know what i mean they yeah. got better actors in mortal kombat and that's why i think that movie works a little bit better um they just had better, I mean, all around, like everybody in that movie, you didn't know who they were. So like, it didn't take you out of the movie to watch it, but also they just picked people just that were better. And maybe they had some special effects like Goro and shit. Um, but, you know, they're just, it's hard to make a video game movie. So that's why, like, when I was watching yeah. this, I was like, is it a bad movie? Yes. But I can sort of put myself back in that time period and just, I mean, they did what they could. I mean, it's hilarious to watch. It's entertaining. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you got a good point, man. I, I can't think of one <clears throat> video game remake that was actually good and, and is like liked by the critics, man. And there's nothing. Um, I mean, you could, you just, especially in the 90s, dude, like even Mario Brothers and shit that like those movies, Mario Brothers is awful, you know. Yeah. And it's filled with stars. It had stars of the nine. It has fucking Bob Hoskins, John Lake Wazamo, and Dennis Hopper in it. And even then, I don't know if it was because they didn't put a lot of money into writing it or they didn't have special effects, but you just, there's just some about it. I mean, now video games are so good looking that I feel like to make a movie is sort of unnecessary because you're, yeah. you're watching it while you play it basically, you know? And uh, this movie actually came out after Raul Julia died, man, and they dedicated it to him. And before this, he had finished the movie called Burning Season, which uh, he got a lot of acclaim for. Uh, and he continued to play in Bison despite being sick. 
Uh, this was actually filmed in Australia in the autumn, man. And uh, he felt that this film would allow him to spend more time with his children who were actually big fans of the video game franchise. And it helped him prepare for the role. Uh, he received his second Saturn Award nomination for his performance, uh, which was considered the high point of the otherwise poorly received motion picture. I mean, the guy, it sucks. He did. This sucks that it was like sort of notably his last movie, but he was just a big part of our childhood. I mean, just being in Adam's family, I feel like for that, just in that alone, we got so much just good acting and he was so good in that, that I just remember being excited. He was in it. And obviously when you watch it, it's just like he gave, he went like a thousand percent, like whatever they put on paper, he's just like, I'm just going to go as hammy and over the top as possible. And just fucking, this is stupid anyway. So why not just go stupid and make it as funny as possible and as big as possible. And uh, on that same day uh, in 94 baseball owners impose a salary cap and they're fiercely opposed by the players. Uh, this would lead to uh, that, that strike or no, this was uh, during that strike. Um, they, they were still going back and forth, even in December. And uh, we would reconvene in 95. I mean, this is when my love of baseball, because I feel like just it not happening when they had that lockout yeah. was enough for me to stop paying attention to it. And uh, I don't know. It's wild. I mean, I get it. You got to get that money. I'll never, I never like be smirching anybody who can get that money. If you can get them to agree to pay you more, why not do it? Fuck it. And do it. also on that same day in 94, uh, fearing arrest by the FBI, Whitey Bulger flees Boston and successfully hides from law enforcement for the next 16 years. Um, in Santa Monica, California, I believe is where he got arrested. Is that where, is that where you used to live? Uh, I mean, I live close to it, but I mean, he just, it's hilarious. Somebody that was notably like this connected to crime and famous for being a scumbag and shit. How I feel, I forget how they found him, but it was just sort of like a random accident that they eventually found him in Santa Monica. I think he fucked like he fucked over some chick or something. I forget, but I mean, Hey dude, he did it. He, he made a good, uh, clean escape. And he was like an informant for the FBI. It's just like crazy. Yeah, he the, could yeah. do that. You know, he could actually disappear like that. That's wild. For 16 years, man. That's I mean, that guy loved the departed and it was kind of based off that. And I don't know if you ever saw the movie where Johnny Depp played him that came out. I mean, it's pretty recent. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very long movie, but Johnny Depp, dude, it's good. It's a good movie to watch, especially if you like Johnny Depp. I mean, that guy's a badass actor. Um, it, it, and Whitey Bulger also looks like this comedian named Honest John. I don't know if you've ever seen him. No. Uh, but yeah, Honest John, he's like an anomaly because he would always be the white guy on the black circuits. He would he was like the he was on an episode of Comic View. He might have done Def Jam and he looks like that. You know what I mean? But he's That's received weird. well by... Yeah, he, he's received well by uh, black audiences, man. Um, Honest John. I remember watching his stuff back in the day, man. Fucking hilarious. But he looks like Whitey Bulger. That's hilarious. Maybe he maybe Whitey Bulger's still on the run. Maybe he's not dead. <laughs> yeah, right. um, dude, Steve, hold on one second. OK, I'll be right back. Well, Honest John, I never I've never heard of Honest John, Steve. Is, is he like he's not like a Gary Owens type? Kind of a Gary Owens where he's he's received well by black audiences, uh, you know, and I don't even think yeah, like I think, yeah, he does touch on the the irony of him being a, like an older white guy, uh, you know, I mean, that has to and, be his yeah. opening joke, Steve. Like he has yeah. to, if he's a, in going in black rooms, I mean, the first thing out of his mouth has to be like, now I know I'm not what you thought was going to come up, you know, some shit like that. He's got to have one of those. Yeah he's just following up uh d ray or like you know <laughs> uh bernie mac or something or he's opening up for bernie mac or some shit you know what i mean yeah mm. but uh on december 23rd 1997 as good as it gets premieres in theaters and i, I remember it getting a lot of nominations and accolades this was around the time of boogie nights and titanic and helen hunt and jack nicholson were thrown in the mix uh i don't know did i'm i think they did actually win 
I think something Jack Nicholson might have won, or somebody got one, or maybe the movie won, or something. But this was just like old people porn. Is that what it is? I feel like I remember this coming out, and uh, you know, I, I think Greg Kinnear is in the movie, and he was sort of getting a pop at this time. But uh, yeah, this was just Jack Nicholson. I think he's like a curmudgeonly dude, and sort of comes around and falls in love. It's one of those type of things. I definitely know my mom and dad. I guarantee if I call them and ask them, they'd love this movie. Uh, they actually won Nicholson and Hunt won the Academy Award for Best Actor and Best Actress, and they got a three hundred and fourteen dollar box office from a fifty million dollar budget. Man, that's crazy, dude. I mean, this this Jack Nicholson. This is when he still had it, he had that Nicholson shine to him. You know, he wasn't yeah. old crazy Jack like he is now. And you know, I, I feel like at some point in my life, I'm going to watch this because Jack Nicholson's in it. He's, I mean, he's, he's an asshole in it. You know, he's like a guy, I feel like he's like agoraphobic or a germaphobe or like, he doesn't like leaving his apartment. There's a lot of shit where he's just like a curmudgeonly sort of, he's not old, but he's just like a curmudgeon. He's this piece of shit. So if you like that, you like Jack Nicholson. I mean, I've, I've seen the movie. Yeah. Look at Greg Kinnear. Look at young Greg Kinnear in there before he was in that weird movie autofocus where him and Willem Dafoe beat off together. It was weird. And Helen Hunt, she's, she's, she's borderline Sandra Bullock territory. You better, hey, <clears throat> you, you better do something dangerous here. I don't know. I mean, she's been in good shit though. I mean, she was in Castaway. I, I used to have this weird crush on Helen Hunt, Steve. I don't know what she is was. attractive. I used I'll to give just her the, have no, this weird attra- in, she, in Castaway. There's a point. I think she goes out in the rain at one point. Young Matt just ate that alive. A lot of nipples. If I was doctor, she, you'd be she, like, oh, nipples. She she has a plain Jane quality to her. She, you know, not a lot, not a glitz and glamour. Just, hey, I'm, I'm Helen Hunt. I just remember so bizarre that yeah. she's in a, she is very, she is very plain Jane. But here's a dangerous thing she did, Steve, that is actually from my experiences in the 90s. Um, in... I believe seventh grade English, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we watched a PSA that was about drugs uh, that Helen Hunt starred in where she sniffs like angel dust and then like jumps out a window and starts scratching. They showed it on Conan O'Brien, I think. They they showed it on SNL when she hosted. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) During her monologue, she mentioned that. Yeah. When she jumps out of a, a glass window. Yeah, she was. I I have good memories of her, but again, like one memory I have have of her has been tainted because I used to love the movie Twister, and then I've seen that recently, and that movie's a giant heaping pile of shit, and she's in that. But so but I, I forgot about that PSA. You're, you're safe with me now, Helen. You're safe. Plain check Jane it out all. because yeah. it is one of the most. I remember. Is that what Angel Dust does? I mean, god damn. Because she, she, I think she survived a three-story drop and then tried to cut herself with some glass. So, damn. It, it, it did have Smokey in a pigeon coop. <laughs> a D, uh, Debo's pigeon coop at that. Uh, yeah, man. You know, man. Now, you know who probably didn't watch As Good As It Gets on December 23rd in 1997, Matthew? Me. Probably Phil Jackson, too. Because he was busy getting another dub as the Chicago Bulls coach reaches 500 wins. Uh, I mean, yeah, man, he, he, I think he's the GOAT. I mean, I, I like uh, the guy for San Antonio, uh, Popovich, but man, the man like got him, more rings than Pat he got Riley, fingers. Riley, like, what was the guy that did UCLA or what did he coach UCLA? I don't know. John Wooden. John Wooden. Yeah. The guy, yeah, he, he coached uh, Bill Walton and uh, Lou Alcindor at the time, yeah. all those greats. I I mean, he's got to be there. I feel like he got sort of uh, his, wasn't he involved as the Knicks for a while? And like, he sort of like tainted his reputation a little bit with that. He he started, yeah, the old age started kicking in and he wasn't as cool, Phil Jackson, you know, because he had said something about LeBron James and his posse. And he had also had some issues with Carmelo, who was the star of the Knicks at the time. So, like, when he said that thing about, like, yeah, I don't know, like, you know, riding around with your posse, you know, all like a lot of basketball players, ball players, they they have their crews that they run with. And the fact that he used the term posse is like, oh, oh. Yeah, right. But, oh. I mean, he wasn't – he also, like, I think he got shit on because, like, 
I don't remember the exact situation. Wasn't he the coach and then like the GM or like something? And he was losing a lot back then. He, he was fuck. He, yeah, he, he was fucking Genie Bus, who's fucking bad. Uh, it, and Jim Bus is uh, the the patriarch of the Laker dynasty. And so Genie Bus is the heir, one of the heirs, and he she just happened to be married to Phil Jackson. Okay, who's the coach. Oh, hey. Yeah, get that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and Jeannie Buss, why we're talking, yeah, man, uh, top tier, a white girl Hall of Fame. You're up there with motherfucking uh, Tiffany Amber Thiessen. Jeannie and, uh, Buss, really? Jeannie mm, makes me bus. Mwah. Fucking look her up. Google those. And, and you do have to factor in that she's up there in age. She She's Jim Buss's daughter. Uh, so, you know, hey, you, you're holding it together in your 50s and chick. Yeah. Oh, my God, Jeannie. Yeah, you can get that work. Steve, there is a photo of her that I think is from Sports Illustrated where she's fully naked holding two basketballs covering her breasts. There you go now. There yeah, you go. Phil was hitting this? The guru. The, the, the Zen master, they call him. Shit, I, that made me start wanting to do some yoga, goddammit. That's a real triangle offense right there. <laughs> Scott, Scotty. They did that on original Kings of Comedy. I, somebody did a great Phil Jackson. I think it was uh, Cedric. It just he had the grovel, the rasp. Uh, uh, Scotty. Uh, but I mean, you can't deny a winner. It's like Tom Brady. Dude. At a certain point, once you start collecting championships and wins like he was, I mean, he had Michael Jordan and that, but. Uh, I'm not going to besmirch a Phil Jackson. I love me some Phil Joe or whatever you want to call him. Uh, somebody who wasn't watching this Chicago Bulls game was probably Caval Colorado Avalanche, Jari Curry. Uh, he was the eighth NHLer to score 600 career goals. Um, I, I don't fuck with hockey. Um, I, I fuck with a little bit more than I did, but Jari Curry or Yari Curry uh, is a name that I remember. Because, you know, I, I feel like he was kind of like a Charles Barkley of, of hockey. You, know, you didn't have to fuck with the sport, but you know of that guy. The only thing I remember, I don't remember that name. If we're talking Colorado Avalanche, and this is only because I watched ESPN so much when I was younger, but there was a goalie they had, I think that was named Patrick Waugh. Waugh, one of the goats. Yeah, yeah and he was he's... probably one of the greatest. But I just was always fascinated with him because of his name. He was He seemed very good at his job. And his last name is spelled R O Y, and I was always confused that that was Wa, but that's French Canucks, yeah. so that is what it is. There, there's a stand-up comedian who mentions that I can't remember. This is mid two thousands, maybe talking about like his name, like that exact thing. Yeah, like, why it's spelled that way? Why is it Wa? It's Roy, fuck? motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but somebody who wasn't watching the Colorado Avalanche or the Chicago Bulls in 97 was probably Terry Nichols. He got arrested blowing up Oklahoma building. This shit was wild. This was one of those things. This was back in those golden days where this kind of shit only happened once yeah. every decade or something. And it was a tragedy. I mean, this was wild. Wasn't there another guy? What was the other guy with this? Timothy McVeigh. Is that the guy? Timothy McVeigh. Yeah. Yeah, that's the guy I feel like I remember more. I don't remember. I feel like that guy's name is more associated than this guy. But fuck this guy, too. Yeah, he, he's not as recognizable. He he looks like he might work in marketing or something. It's like he fucks like, kids. He doesn't look like he would be doing some violent shit, like blowing up a building, you know? I think Terry Nichols had a guile. Maybe that's what guile is based off of. <laughs> He, he he added more of a dynamic look. Timothy uh, McVeigh, you mean? Who did I say? Terry Nichols. Timothy, Terry Nichols. Oh, Timothy McVeigh, yeah. They're both fucking losers. Wow. Uh, Guile. But, yeah. Don't get shade thrown at Guiles. Why are you doing that, Steve? You're about to get a visit. Sonic boom. Sonic boom. Man, catch a Hadouken, motherfucker. <laughs> or a spinning Taikin. <laughs> Can't fuck with him. Sonic Boom. That's it. That's that's the one that's representing. He can America. generate really? a Sonic Boom with the, his fucking. That's kind of yoked he is. With, with his with, with his uh rays, with his fucking uh Timberlands, he can do a little fucking cartwheel kick in his Timberlands. Oh, that's the, try doing a bicycle kick, Steve, and see what you do. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, Sonic Boom. <laughs> that shit ain't that shit ain't more gangster than Hadouken, motherfucker. Get the fuck out. 
But in 1998, December 23rd, The Thin Red Line premiered in theaters. Yeah, I don't, I, like I said, we discussed this before like we watched everything. And all I can remember about this is that it was more of a cerebral war movie. It was like a war movie, but it was also just a very quiet war movie. I think there was a lot of like yeah. poems and stuff being read in it. A, a, a platoon of the 90s in a way. Yeah, but I I don't know. I used to eat these because I feel like this came out after Saving Private Ryan, if I'm not mistaken. And I just feel uh, like I think it did. By and, a couple months, yeah, I believe. Because But I just yeah. feel like people were hot to watch a war movie, which is how this movie got put out. Because people were like, oh, is it like Saving Private Ryan? And then it was not like that. And that's why I say I think maybe I got conned mm-hmm. into watching this because of that. And it left a bad taste in my mouth because I do not remember it, this movie at all, other than the celebrities it, being in it and it being. Born. Yeah. Sean Penn's Andrew, Adrian Brody's Jim Caviezel, Jesus Christ himself, fucking Ben Jacklin, George Clooney's. Yeah, George John Clooney's Kinsack. in this? George fucking Clooney's. Yes. Maybe that. Okay. Is Nick Nolte in this, Steve? Nick, Nick Nolte. Okay. Uh, Woody Harrelson's fucking John C. Riley, fucking Dewey Cox. Fuck I mean, if you kind of look at Saving Private Ryan, that's what they did, though. There's so many celebrities in that movie, and they're just, like, you know, peppered throughout it. They're not all in, like, the same group or any. It's not like a Dirty Dozen type fucking thing. It was nominated for seven Academy Awards. Best Dirty Picture, things. Best Director, Screenplay, Cinematography, Film Editing, Dramatic Score, Best Sound. Best, uh, most Coke done by Nick Nolte in a film. Also, or Mess, or whatever his brand. This is when Nick Nolte's brand was really starting to sort of fade. You know what I mean? I feel like he got here, and then he got to. He was in a. They made a Hulk movie with Eric Bana. It was like the I first, remember. and he was the villain in it. But he was like fully cracked out at that point. They just had to sort of use him as he was, and it was very weird. And I feel like that's when he started to nosedive a little bit, but. Hey, maybe I'll go back and watch a thin red line, Steve, because this is one of those that I think uh, pot erased from my memory. You know, I think I need to watch that, too, man. I remember liking it back then. Uh, But you have any callbacks, shout outs or shit like that? Man, I'm calling you out, mother. No, No, I just uh, I wanted to say um, just as I kind of went into it when we were talking about Street Fighter, but I feel like invariably I have to call out Mortal Kombat, the movie, whenever I mention Street Fighter, because to me, they're they're hand in hand. They're walking down the same path. And I just got to shout out Mortal Kombat as being the superior movie and being a shining beacon of what's possible when you do uh, video game movies uh, more so than Street Fighter, right? The guy who played Liu Kang, God bless him. I don't remember his name. I don't think I ever knew his name. But that man was made to play Liu Kang. And I just, I love Mortal Kombat, the movie. Shout out. And uh, I wish we could have watched that instead of Street Fighter. But Street Fighter, to all the haters out there, you're, you're hating way too hard. It's not the worst movie I've ever seen. And it really does nothing for your health. It does... Stop hating. I mean, when a movie's bad, hate on. Please, by all means. But this is just a 90s movie that they had a lot of money, a lot of cocaine, and a lot of people who knew how to do martial arts, and that was the thing. That's that's what happened. Yeah, man. And uh, today's actually, December 23rd is actually Festivus Day. Festivus for the rest of us, Steve. Festivus for the rest of us. And at some point, we, we have to. Uh, cover this episode it didn't air on december 23rd uh but it's hilarious and uh it's basically served as an alternative to the pressures of uh buying shit and just being a a consumer uh which is typical here that's our thing america's producing buying i love that's on sale i love shit steve give me some new shit this motherfucker you got your whole cart full on amazon.com as we speak yeah it's full it's just filled with goodies steve but i did i this is something i mean festivus i mean that became a whole fucking thing 
even as a yeah. non Seinfeldian, I still knew what Festivus was. When did yeah. when did it start? Like, do you know? Do we have like a baseline year of when Festivus came? Uh, it, it was actually originated from a book. Uh, the the writer of this episode, uh, O'Keefe, I, I believe is the last name. His father is an author, and Festivus was mentioned in one of his novels. And so O'Keefe, the son, he wanted to implement this into the episode. He didn't, he kind of had the same uh, response as George because George was reluctant to even tell him about it. They were like, what's Festivus? And, it, but the, the other writers, they found out about Festivus through his younger brother. He's like, oh no, dude, we got to get this in the show. And so in Festivus, uh, this episode called The Strike, uh, it features George's parents, which is always a gem, man. You, you get Frank in there, it, it, it's going to pop. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he, he's just so dramatic. And there, there's parts of, of the Festivus. There's a airing of grievances. Of course, there's an aluminum pole uh, instead of a tree. And there's a battle of, of of strength, uh, feats of strength, and the the patriarch or, or the man of the household. If you can beat that person, if you can wrestle them and pin that person down, the Festivus can end. And why it's so cringe for George is because he can never beat his father. Uh, you know, when it's time to start grappling, uh, Frank always beats his ass, and he's <laughs> like, "Ah, oh, it's time for the feats of strength, George." Ah, fuck. <laughs> so yeah, man. Happy Festivus for the rest of us, man. And once again, uh, say Saved by the Bell airs another episode on a Sunday called The Glee Club, and this features Tori Spelling. Uh, yeah, Aaron's little baby girl, and she's supposed to be dating Screech, and Tori Spelling's character doesn't want uh, the parents doesn't want their daughter to see screech and it becomes this whole thing of like sneak in screech uh tell them i'm not you know going out with screech kind of deal but yeah what is she like, i don't remember you. that i don't remember tori spelling being does she have like glasses and shit yep. she's all she's was, ultra nerdy right she's ultra nerdy okay. i don't remember them all matt remember got all. it got it yeah we're gonna get back to you bayside yeah <laughs> and Dude, I've noticed, man, you, we posted some videos of Bayside when we covered that episode last week. And God damn it, that shit was like a viral video. I, I put it up uh, one second, the next minute, uh, 700 likes. I swear, man. To pop, uh, people uh, young and old. There's, I mean, it's kind of crazy how far, how much legs that show has. I mean, they made a new one, but even the old one, I mean, God damn. It's, it's timeless, man. But uh, yeah, please like, share, subscribe, and comment, and share. Check out Over the Culture, as well as Crushgasm, and B3F Podcast on all streaming platforms just like ours. This is Steve G and Maggie with Happen in the 90s.